Is it good enough? I think it's on. Yeah, we have power up here. Yep. Yep. Is anyone? Is anyone going to put it on? Yeah, I would put it on. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's uh, it's not on yet, so I can't turn it off. Set up a projector on top of a ladder, yeah. <laughs> and like I roped off the entire area. It's like, do not walk through here. If this projector gets unplugged, it will explode. <laughs> so, and it was okay, oh, but so like but, it would have been a much but, better story. If, uh, but like I had to worry with one ready? of the actors. Was really no, 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 no. Oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> leave me on the. Oh, I was checking to see if it was off. Oh. The fan is still. So we need uh, the cable. Uh, we want to replug the cable because it's stretching. Like it's. I guess it probably won't make a difference. Right, no, let's just forget yeah, about that. Let's, let's yeah. just whoever sits there. If anybody comes in, we'll just tell them. Yeah. So I need to. Does anyone know how I? Uh, yeah. That's good. Oh, that's good. I thought it was like some kind of file. Is that, is that focused? Yeah, that's focused. Yeah, that's good. It's yeah. slightly skewed. Yeah, we'll, we'll do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Should we kill the lights? Or? Yeah, that would be. Um, actually looks really bright. I think yeah. that it's no problem. Yep. Yeah. You guys have less chance of falling asleep. Slightly less chance of falling asleep if we leave the lights on. Plugged into power, it's going to keep no, no. turning off. No, no, I think your your computer was going to sleep. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So oh. Let me just plug it into mm -hmm. the power cable. Mm -hmm. Then we won't have that trouble. Mm -hmm. see so many familiar faces in the audience, so I wasn't expecting that. Um, yeah, so this is a talk uh, about Pravana phonology, but maybe a little bit different than, um, well, if you, if you go to Pravana phonology conferences these days, there's lots of, uh, lots of geometric representation theory and, and quite a bit of algebra. And this, is a, this, is a, this talk is in a rather different spirit. It's, um, it, it's Pravana phonology from a topologist's point of view. And it's sort of a, this more, more old fashioned topology and basically no algebra in, in, what, in what goes into this. So let's start um, using this funny software called Apologize for Writing. But it's kind of. So let's, uh, let's talk about four manifold invariants for Kavana. So this is, uh, this is joint work with Chris Douglas, who's at Oxford, and Kevin Walker, who's at, uh, at Microsoft in Santa Barbara. And the, the whole point of, of today's talk is to convince you that we can define an invariant of four manifolds, in particular of smooth four manifolds, which takes values in double graded vector spaces. If you know and love Kravana homology, that double grading is just the usual double grading in Kravana homology. If you don't already know and love Kravana homology, ignore this, we're just associating vector spaces to four manifolds. Now, if the manifold is boundary, that's fine, and moreover, you can specify a link in that, bound, in that three manifold boundary. And we're still just getting a vector space for that whole configuration. Four manifold plus a new manifold. And um, it's a strict generalization of the manifold model in the following sense. If you just take your four manifold to be the standard four ball, and you have some link in that free sphere boundary, then this vector space that the machine I'm going to describe to associates to this pair is exactly just what you do of that uh, So one way that you can think about this is that it's associated, this, this machinery is going to associate a vector space 
to a link in any three manifold, but it's your responsibility to provide a particular four manifold that fills that three manifold in before my machinery can do it. Okay? So you can see this here. You can use the kind of one from all the loop. You've got to show me the standard for this machine. Okay. So um, yeah, let's see how we do this. So I'm going to divide up the talk into, into a few pieces. And the, the, in the first piece, I'm going to describe a very general framework for producing this sort of invariant vector spaces for, for core manifolds. And there won't actually be any Kovana formality in this first section of the talk. I'm going to describe to you some algebraic gadget, which is sufficient to define these invariants. And then in the second half of the talk, I'm going to explain how Kovana formality provides you with that sort of algebraic gadget. Uh, so the first part might feel like abstract nonsense, which it is, but it's, it's nice abstract. So let's jump in there and try and understand this thing. Uh, so at this point, I have to apologize and admit that these were slides that I used in another conference a few months ago, and I didn't really change them. Uh, and so uh, the first thing I wanted to say here is there'll be no new ingredients. There's no differential equations and no categorical point of groups. And the reason why I had that, those points there was this was a conference where Widen was speaking, and he had some crazy interpretation of Kavana homology involving differential equations and five manifolds. And it was terrifying. And we have none of that. We're, we're really just going to use the original 2001 description of Kravana homology, basically nothing more, and just think about it in the right way to do everything else. So if you intervene 10 years of work on Kravana homology, mostly irrelevant for, uh, for what goes into this work. Uh, so, first of all, I'm going to describe this framework that I need to use. language that a, that a category theorist would like. And then I'll say it again, not too explicitly giving you, giving you definitions that don't require you to know any of the terminology. But this first bit is, well, the topologists have thought about topo topological quantum field theory and invariance of manifolds before. I just want to explain how what I'm doing relates to, to uh, things you might have already thought about. But you can also ignore the next four slides and wait for the specific sentence. So the idea is that any time you have an n category, whatever that is, some sort of n-dimensional algebraic object, you get an n plus epsilon dimensional topological point of field. So let me explain what that is. In particular, what I want an n plus epsilon dimensional TQ of T to provide for me is a vector space for every n manifold and a map for every map in some So all, another way of saying that is just that I you need to have a vector space for every n manifold. And if you give me a diffeomorphism from one n manifold to another one, I need to be able to give you an isomorphism between uh, those two, the, the, the two vector spaces associated with those two. And this is what the n plus epsilon part is, is referring to. It tells you a little bit about stuff one dimension out. So mapping cylinders of diffeomorphisms are, uh, are n plus one manifolds, and we're going to associate maps to, to mapping cylinders but a general n plus one dimensional manifold, we're not necessarily associating anything to. And this is the distinction that n plus epsilon is getting at. If you see people talk about n plus one dimensional T of Ts, by that they mean vector spaces for n manifolds and numbers for n plus one manifolds. Or more generally, if the n plus one manifold has an incoming n manifold boundary and an outgoing n manifold boundary, that n plus one manifold is meant to give you a map between the vector spaces. We have a slightly more recent. Now, this recipe, in quotes, has um, many different uh, realizations, different ways of, of, of uh, turning this into a theorem, a way to, to generate a TQFT community. And I don't really want to go into all of that today because we don't need it. Um, but I wanted to advertise this. We'll have to do that in quotes. Um, one way of doing that is in a paper of mine with Kevin Walker called The Blob. I think this, this definition is nice for topologists who don't otherwise care about it. Okay. Now, sometimes, but not always, you can do better than this. If this n category that you plug into this recipe satisfies some extra conditions, which often people talk about as being finite conditions of some sort, then you can get more. Then you really can get this, this n plus 1 dimensional extension, where it's n plus 1 manifolds give you linear maps. 
Now, the thing to say is that we are very definitely not going to see the second half of the structure coming from Kavanaugh. And uh, I think that it's important emphasizing this because people who think about Kavanaugh phenomenology often expect this part of the structure when they think about defining manifold invariant from Kavanaugh. Let me explain how they've come to expect that and why they're wrong. Uh, so here's, well, so you can see, maybe, as you can see, I really did write these slides a while ago, and you remember what order is coming. Um, let me just mention two examples before saying what this, what this complication is. So, uh, essentially the point of these two examples is just to, to indicate to you that if you've ever heard the phrase Turayev Bureau, or Witten Reshetik and Turayev, then you've seen the n equals 2 and n equals 3 instances of what I had on the previous slide. So, what are Turayev Bureau invariants, Turayev Bureau TQFTs? Start with just a tensor category. Uh, more honestly, a tensor category with dual, so you need a bit more data. Then there's a, there's a canonical way to associate vector spaces to surfaces. So a tensor category, a tensor category is, is, is uh, from a category theorist's point of view, roughly the same thing as a two category, since we have some Tensor category is given variance of two variants on these surfaces. And there's some extra condition you can put on these things called fusion, that means that you to the, to the, the dimension of the possible. And if you haven't heard of Twilight Bureau before, you don't need to know anything more than that there exists a, a very explicit description of this previous possible dimension of two. Now, let's think about what happens one dimension up. So, there's this machinery called the Witten, Reshetik, and Turayev invariants, where you expect that, well, the, the, the usual way it's described is that as input, you have something called a modular tensor category. So this is some category where you have objects and morphisms, you can compose the morphisms, that's what you have in every category, but there's also tensor products, so you can take tensor products of objects and tensor products of morphisms. And there's also a grading, that is if you have an object, if you look at A tensor B, so A and B are objects, there's a, there's a, uh, a one given map from A tensor B to B tensor A, and then you switch the order of tensor products that you always draw as a little crossing in like in the, in the grade group. And the point is that these maps satisfy the identities you'd expect from these diagrams. That is, if you swap A and B and then swap them again, that's not necessarily the identity map, just because that grade is not the identity map, but the identities in the grade group are satisfied. Um, yeah, so, so in particular, you, you ask that this map is an isomorphism, so it has an inverse, and you might as well draw that inverse as the other crossing. Uh, okay, so that's what a, a graded tensor category is for people who haven't seen them. And uh, the category theoretical yoga, which I will avoid explaining, but you can explain another time if you're interested really says that, well, great intensive categories are, are, you can think of them as three categories. So follow this general recipe, and you expect to get vector spaces for three manifolds. And maybe, if that great intensive category satisfies some special condition, it turns out to be known a little bit as e modular, then you also get maps for, for four manifolds. And a good way, well, uh, something to have in mind here is that when Richard and Teraya and so on were first doing this, they had particular instances of these graded tensor categories in mind, namely the representation theory of a quantum field. But it is a more general quantum theory. Takes us into a graded tensor category and gives you a vector space. Now, so are there actually three modular categories? I think we've got a bunch of categories, but are there that actually forgive? Um, I mean, so, actually, so the, the representation theory of any quantum group at a root of unity is certainly one of these things. Oh, pretty much. I see. Yeah, I mean, I mean, all of the usual good and measure taken to write, I mean, the quantum group at a root of unity exactly gives you. Uh, so they also come equipped with maps. Yeah, yeah. Now, 
Are those maps interesting? Or? Well, let me, let me explain. Oh, the, the, this, is the, this is the confusing point for people like you who already know about Rudin Machete and Trad and Variance. Which is that this is not, the right hand side here is not what most people would think Rudin Machete and Trad produces. Most people would say, no, 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 no that's silly. Rudin Machete and Trad takes a gradient to its academy and produces vector space valued invariants for surfaces and numbers for three numbers. But I'm telling you that it all happens one dimension further up. Okay? Well, Mike Vimmo recently disagrees with what everyone is. So here's the thing. If you add one more condition on your pre-modular tensor category, that is, you drop the pre, you have a modular tensor category, then these invariants in my, my usual recipe is defined <coughs> only depend very weakly on the interiors of these three informal points. In particular, well, they roughly don't depend at all, very weakly. So, how do you get to the usual way of thinking about it? Well, in the usual way of thinking about it, we're meant to associate a, a vector space to, to each two. So I'm saying, if you want to see it via this recipe, first of all, you have to pick some pre-manifold which bounds that two manifold. Okay? Then you feed it into my recipe and get a vector space. Okay? But then I assure you that that vector space you got only depended very weakly, maybe not at all, on the pre-manifold. So you can sort of push all the invariants down one another because of the fact they depend very weakly in that sense, the answer to your question is no. These maps of four manifolds are boring. They only depend on what they're mapping from. So there are some signatures that come in that, that give you more scalar correctly. Scale That's a simple answer. OK. But what I want to argue is that this simplification, that people are so used to thinking about this case as modular tensor categories, we can push everything down a little, is extremely misleading. And if you want to do something with Kavanaugh homology, put this simplification out of your mind and just follow the, the more generic recipe. Uh, and so let's see how that works. Um, so <coughs> roughly, Kravano homology is meant to have something to do with quantum groups, or maybe some categorified version of quantum groups. But when you think about quantum groups, there's all this very special behavior that happens at roots of unity. It's very complicated and very interesting. And it's that special behavior at root of roots of unity that gets you to this special case where you're looking at modular tensor categories rather than just, just the more general class of graded tensor categories. But when you go think about Kravana homology, and people have been thinking about it for 10 years now, there's just no sign of, of that special root of unity behavior. Special things happen to quantum groups at roots of unity. Kravana homology is meant to be some more complicated version of quantum group theory, but just we don't see any trace of special behavior in okay. So let's just forget that quantum groups can give you modular tensor categories by roots of unity and just think about what we can do uh, generically away from it. And so that's what I'm that's what I'm proposing here. Quantum groups, we should think of as just giving us some three category without these finite list conditions and without this extra special condition that lets us push everything down a dimension. Then the modern homology being sort of more complicated version one level up suggests that we should try and build a four category instead of a three category. And since we see no sign of root of unity behaving for modern homology, maybe we shouldn't expect to see any of the sort of finite conditions here that let you go up to dimension four. Okay. That's a long preamble. Uh, isn't necessarily hugely motivating for people who have been following the last 10, 15, or 20 years. Okay, let's, yeah. Just to remind me, a, a, a three category, so two category of two morphisms between morphisms. Yep. And then yep. a three category of three morphisms between, between two, two morphisms. morphisms. Yep, yep, that's that the sort of thing we have in mind. But you don't need to, although that's a great thing to, to have in mind, you don't need to have that in mind for any of the rest of the talk. N categories will never be mentioned again, I hope, <laughs> in the rest of the talk. Uh, maybe at the very end. Because now, what I want to do is Rather than building a four category out of Kravana homology that, that category theorists would recognize, I'm going to build a very closely related object that's good enough for our purposes, but it's, it's much more meta. So let's, let's uh, see how it works. So the second half of the, this framework is to describe what I want to call a lasagna algebra. And on this slide, I guess first, a lasagna diagram. So let me tell you what this gadget is, and then 
then maybe I'll give you some motivation by thinking about what lower dimensional versions of this might look like. But let's, let's be bold and put coordination into the world now. A lasagna diagram consists of the following diagram. V north, a four ball, and this whole picture is contained inside a four ball. Then a collection of embedded four balls in the interior, so these are the VIs, which are disjoint, and I think of them as being cut out. So we're looking at the big four ball with some smaller four balls. Size, and a surface in this complementary region called sigma. This is obviously several dimensions down from the real picture. This is a surface sitting in four space. Okay? Four balls cut out from the inside. Uh, and if you think about it, how does a surface meet the boundary of a four ball? Well, it meets it in a, in a length. I mean, a surface is co-dimension two in a four space, so when it meets the boundary of all these balls, it's in co-dimension two. So we also have these LIs for the lengths that the surface meets the balls. So L north on the outside, and the LIs on the inner balls. The lengths could be completely empty, and the surface could be empty. Yeah, so, so. Okay. so that whole gadget there is a lasagna diagram. And what do we do with lasagna diagrams? Well, lasagna diagrams um, index the operations in a thing called a lasagna algorithm. So, what is a lasagna algorithm? So, the following two pieces of data. For every link embedded in a three sphere, it's meant to produce some vector space. Okay? For every lasagna diagram, so I'm just doing sigma here, but that's meant to stand for that whole pack of sigma inside this ball and the excise ball. <laughs> it's meant to give you a linear map from the tensor product of the vector spaces associated with the inner balls to the vector space associated with the outer So, you think of it as being some operation. Plug in elements in the balls and you get an element the And the <laughs> conditions that this data satisfies are sort of the sensible ones. Well, maybe I think I'll say So the first one says that these maps can't depend on the surface in too much detail. You isotope the surface around, leaving the boundaries fixed, the links aren't allowed to move, just the surface in the interior. If you isotope the surface around the map can't change. Okay. And then the second thing is that the maps are compatible with gluing lasagna diagrams. So if, imagine I had some big lasagna diagram and it's got some, some ball cut out on the inside. And then I've got some smaller lasagna diagram whose outer link is the same link as the link on that inner ball. And I can take that second lasagna diagram and just paste it into the bigger lasagna diagram and get a new lasagna diagram. So I can compose the lasagna diagrams by pasting them inside each other. So this is what this picture is meant to represent. Again, the dimensions which we are. Here it would be two smaller lasagna diagrams the holes and getting new lasagna. Yes? Why lasagna? Okay. Um, okay. Can you answer that later? Yeah, yeah, okay. right away. So let, let me answer that. Let's think down a bunch of dimensions, okay? So here we had four balls and we had two dimensions, two surfaces. Okay. So that was the, uh, that was the n equals four, k equals two case of an n the k tester. <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's let's go down even further and, and see something maybe a bit more familiar. Let's look at n equals two, k equals one. I really asked for it. <laughs> no. Uh, th th this word doesn't appear in print in like oh, okay. you're, 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 you're privileged to be doing it. Talk about it. So hear the real terminology. Okay. So what does this mean to look like? Well, what this means is that for each now that this is a literal. Each, um, uh, one sphere, that's just a circle, with a codimension one manifold in it. So the, the key here is telling us the codimension. You've got four balls in codimension two spell. You've got two balls in codimension one spell. If you have a circle with codimension one spell, that's just a collection of points. Okay. So for each collection of points in a circle, we need to associate some vector space. And for each big circle with some big Big disks and disks dis dis at size and put them in one stuff sitting in between. Okay. That's meant to give us a map from the inner vector space to the outer vector space. Okay. So this gadget here has been talked about for quite a while. This thing is known in the literature as a planar algebra. They were invented by Bill Jones, uh, written down by Bill Jones. Uh, used to study subfactors of all things, but since came in from lots of other places, uh, 
Okay, so I've told you what a lasagna algebra is now. So, so the A yeah. of algebra is that is, uh, it's not associated with the ice hockey. Yeah, so for each, if, yeah, so for if, each so if I, if I move my link a little bit, I get a, a, a different, different vector space. space. Yeah, so they're each, all the same. Each particular space. embedded link, I want a vector space. Now, um, maybe I should have some. Uh, oh, no, no, no. But okay, maybe one thing I should say is that, like, the the medial lasagna diagram, right? just have like, a single cutout ball and some link here, and then just take the cylinder over that, and the same link on the outside. Maybe I should insist that that map is the identity. And if I insist that, then the, that means that the vector spaces associated to two isotopic links must be isomorphic, but they're not canonical. Uh, depending on the, on the isotope. Depending on the isotope. Wait, no, I, I think you. So say that you let's let's just I'm I'm two different. Mm -hmm. you imagine, mm -hmm. like, so say that I have um, I move here, it's a very boring link, mm -hmm. and I isotope it into some different position and use some isotopic groups that are out. Uh -huh. okay. Then I can look at I can impose that oh, in, the next in thing. this guy. Okay. So now I have a map from this link to this isotopic version and another map back again. That's isotopic to the cylinder, which is the identity. So my each of these maps must be isotopic. Great. Okay, that's a lasagna algebra. Now, what do you do with a lasagna algebra? Well, the point is, as soon as you have a lasagna algebra, you immediately get invariants and four manifolds of the type that I described. And it's a very simple recipe, although at first glance it looks like it's somewhat ridiculous. I never thought of that. <laughs> Thank you for spoiling the word recipe for me. <laughs> okay, so I guess I didn't. Okay, so what do we do? Given this input, some four manifold and a link in the down, we need to tell you a vector space. So, first of all, let me tell you an absolutely enormous vector space. So, an enormous quotient, I'm just going to tell you this bit of parentheses here, which is just the vector space, uh, this vector space that is a giant direct sum over lasagna diagrams in W, that is, configurations of balls and surfaces in between the balls. The surface has to meet the specified limit in the, in the outside boundary. Okay. Now, for each one of those configurations, for each one of these lasagna diagrams in W, what do I do? Well, I take the tensor product of the vector spaces associated with inner balls. Okay. So I've described now some giant vector space. It's a direct sum over these pictures of the tensor products of the spaces. I can equivalently think of that as just sort of labeled lasagna diagrams where each ball comes labeled with an element of the corresponding vector space. Okay? Some enormous vector space. Then I... The whole thing is not required to be a ball anymore. Yeah, so when, when we specify the four manifold that we want to produce the invariant of, we look at the lasagna diagrams in that ball. The, the inner bits each have to be balls because the lasagna algebra only tells us how to associate anything with balls. But we're, so the idea here is that we're sort of giving a canonical extension of the data that the lasagna algebra assigns to to balls to, to arbitrary form. Okay. So that's some enormous, ridiculous, infinite dimensional vector space. Now I need to tell you how to take some quotient to get something else. And what the quotient over there is meant to be saying is that whenever you see one of these diagrams, what you can do is choose some ball embedded in the in the interior of the four manifold that um, is a properly nested with the actual with the balls you see here. It can't um, it can't cut through these. I think it'll probably contain them or, 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 or be destroyed. So if you take some embedded ball, say I took a ball just here, then what we're allowed to do is excise everything in that ball, okay, and replace it with what we get by applying this lasagna diagram you see in that ball to the elements in the balls that we cut out. <coughs> So the important points are extremely small here. But here we had x in that vector space and y in that vector space. And what I'm saying over here is that we can cut out a little region closing those two balls and replace it with a big ball 
labeled by whatever the Lasagna algebra applied to sigma. Oh, that's a, that's applied a relation. To X and that, y. That, that equal sign is, is connecting those two as a relation that you're modding out the. Exactly, yeah. Maybe, maybe I should have said minus sign. I mean, I'm setting these two things up well, in that big vector space. That's the question. So is that something like taking the original thing and modding it up by like some action of A to remember the original algebra to remember it? Like is that, I mean, could I sort of I imagine sort of putting that other thing inside and then saying, well, I'm just identifying it. I'm not sure. Okay, I'm not sure. Right. But maybe one, one more thing to say about this little note, see what we're describing, is that this quotient actually means that everything in this big vector space is represented by uh, some diagram with just a single internal ball. Because for any four manifold, you can lay, shove in some ball, it takes up almost all of the space. Okay? So you can certainly enclose everything in just a single ball. But if you do it that way, it's not, I mean, that doesn't describe to you the whole vector space because there are, there are, cra there are crazy quotient, there are crazy, crazy extra relations you get. Uh, you can imagine we had our, our four manifold and we filled it up with some big ball like that. Okay. Well, um, the point is that it's all the two elements. Say I took that ball and that ball. So I took This guy's got two different balls in it, different elements of, of A of those balls. And there are two different ways that I could get from here to here. I could sort of engulf the two of them joining this one on this side, or I could engulf the two of them joining this one on this side. Okay? And they were both with elements in, in this sum of the big vector space, so they both have to be equal. So even in that single sum of the big vector space, there are the same sort of equations. Is just sort of an example of, of a possible label design diagram. A little bit, yeah. yeah. Okay, inside there, what you actually have is a, is a direct sum of A, L1, and, and A, L2. It's the tensor product. So oh, the tensor product, yeah, okay. Yeah. And then you mark, and you say, well, we're going to mark X and Y. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, maybe another way that you can think about There's this, imagine this huge diagram of the vertex in the diagram is some lasagna diagram in your manifold. But it sort of forms a cursor where the edges are given by engulfing parts of your lasagna diagram in a bigger hole. One way of saying this definition is that we're sort of taking a curling of along that big diagram of okay. lasagna diagrams and engulfing. That's even more abstract. Okay, let's proceed on this. This thing is ridiculously infinite. Mm -hmm. this is a lot of and this is a lot of relations. So who knows at this point what we're going to get. Um, let me jump very far in advance to say that. Well, uh, if you're working on the standard four ball, if your W is just the standard four ball, then you just get the usual Kravata homology of the link, which is a finite dimensional vector space. That's a decent sign. Um, in a few examples we've calculated, we tend, for anything except the four sphere, we tend to get infinite dimensional answers, but they're finite dimensional in each graded piece according to some grade. So you do get infinite dimensional answers, but maybe not as badly as you as you might think. Okay. Let me shoot <laughs> that. Okay. Uh, this slide is, is sort of pointless. Um, the, 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 the idea that I'm trying to convey here is just that 
I've explicitly axiomatized a lasagna algebra and told you how to construct four manifold invariants for it. But what I really want to say is just that this is a, a sort of custom axiomatization of a particular class of four categories. That's sort of easier to comprehend than the general axiomatization of an abstract four category, of a general four category. And the recipe I've told you is just the general recipe that's out there, sort of restricted to the special case. Okay. And so then the second point is that because we know about this TQFT framework, this recipe, I told you how to get vector spaces for four manifolds, but the general framework we have out there leads us to expect that the same recipe can be used to associate let's see, vector spaces for four manifolds, it's going to associate categories to three manifolds, two categories to two manifolds, three categories to one manifolds, and four categories to zero manifolds, namely the point. And indeed, this recipe will associate to a point this four categories. All I want to say is that this recipe provides us with stuff for all the lower dimensional stuff as well. We might come back to that at the end of the how over time. Okay, there's the general framework. Now on to Kravano phenomenology. Yes. And uh, let's see if we can understand why Kravano phenomenology is a lasagna algorithm. So there are a number of difficulties. And uh, it turns out we need to learn one new thing about Kravano homology than was previously known uh, in order to, to, to build a lasagna, out of, a lasagna algebra out of Kravano homology. And essentially, all the difficulties and the new things we need to learn are because of the difference between B3 and S3. Essentially, in a lasagna algebra, we need to associate a vector space to each link in a three sphere. Kravano homology doesn't quite do that. It gives you a vector space for each link in a three ball. And there are actually subtle issues in the difference between. Let's try and understand what those different what that difficult is. Okay. So first of all, Kravano homology is defined combinatorial. There aren't geometric definitions. All the definitions require a presentation of your link, a particular link diagram, in order to get going. And you'll later prove that different link diagrams give you some other answers. So here's the way to think about it. It is this combinatorial version of uh, not be You have link diagrams and then moves between them consisting of Reitermeister and Morse moves. But then there are what are called movie moves. And what these capture is that if there are two different sequences of Reitermeister and Morse moves that get you between um, uh, one initial link and, and, a, and a final link, they might or might not represent isotopic surfaces, or they might not. But if they represent isotopic sur surfaces, then there is a finite list of moves called movie moves that let you turn that sequence of right and spring moves from one of those sequences into the other. Okay? It's a combinatorial description of when the sequences of right and moves are isotopic, they must be relatable by some list of moves. Is that sort of like a higher moves? Yeah, and you can think of this as being sort of a two category. Yeah. So, Kravano homology works by defining something from these combinatorial pieces. The particular link diagram gives you a chain complex in graded vector spaces. Each randomized from Morse move, it gives you a chain map <coughs> between the corresponding chain complexes. And for each Rooney move, it, 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 well, I wrote here that it gives you a homotopy between the chain maps. It's actually a little bit weaker than that. It just, the monophonology only assures you that there exists a homotopy between the chain maps. It doesn't make any explicit. But that's not a big deal, because then if you take homology of this whole column here, you get doubly graded vector spaces for linked diagrams, and the honest media maps for um, uh, isotopic classes of, of, uh, of, random, of sequences of random maps. So that's the combinatorial business that the one homology does. And it's not, it's, not, it's not a concern to us today what it actually does. In Okay, so here's a bit of formal nonsense, but it's a good bit of formal nonsense. There's, there's an inclusion of, of, uh, of categories. And then let's look at the big one first. Let's look at actual links in V3, particular embedded links. Okay? And as morphisms between them, probordisms from one link to another. Okay? Now, sitting inside that category, there's a subcategory consisting of only those links which have a generic projection. Okay? 
Could we just like take some direct projection? Yeah, Pre this is the standard view for this. Yeah, with coordinates just and project all. down to the x, y. Yeah, yep, yeah, exactly. So we just we take this subcategory. We only take limits which pre predict generic, and we only take cobordisms which project generically as well. But it turns out, so th this thing over here is essentially what we were talking about before. Links for the generic projection are linked up. Okay? And the borders into the generic projection are sequences of random aspects. But it's easy to see that this inclusion is an equivalence of categories. Okay? So if you know how to define things just on this subcategory, you really know how to define things everywhere. So at this point, what do we have? We can really say that Kavada chronology honestly gives us a particular vector space for each embedded link, not just an isomorphism class of vector spaces for, for, for an isotopy class of links, but each individual link gives us a different vector space. And each isotopy implements a particular isomorphism. But this picture is all in B3. Okay? We, we, we still need to do something to get to S3. So, so are, you, are you hinting at that that wouldn't be true if you replaced B3 by S3? Um, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I don't know how to perform, how to, how to say an analogous story. So those last two slides working in S3 rather than B3. So, um, oh, the, the, so, okay. So, so that, that for links in S3, you could thing. talk about um, links which have a generic projection to the equatorial S2. And um, there, the, um, yeah, that, 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 that really isn't an equivalent. So, because of the ability. You're, 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 you're preempting my next four oh, slides. Sorry. <laughs> but great, yeah, yeah, no. I mean, we're, we're going to get, a, we're get around that in a slightly different way, but that's a, yeah, that's a good observation. That all. The point is we're going to cheat. We're just going to take the stuff that does work in B3 and, and, and uh, do a bunch of abstract nonsense to get something next time. But that abstract nonsense is going to depend on some detail about the one you previously didn't. Let, let's see how he does. So what I want to do, how am I going to cheat? I want to give you a vector space for a link in S3. And I know how to do it for a link in B3, so let's just delete a point. Okay? The problem is that which point you delete will give you different answers. So we kind of have to uniform over all choices. So the idea is that I'm, what I'm going to do is define the Kavanaugh homology for a link in S3 as the flat sections of this, this crazy bundle. So the base space of this bundle is all the points that we could delete, that is, the complement of the link in S3. Okay. So given a point in the complement of the link, what can I do? Well, I can delete that point. Now I have a link in a three ball, so command homology tells me how to give a vector space for that. For that. So I, now I have this big bundle of vector spaces sitting over a complement of this. What I need to do, what's that? Yeah, there's some finite dimensional vector space sitting over every point in S3. S3 minus three. And there's a parallel transport in this bundle. If I have two different points and some arc connecting them that stays in S3 cross S3 minus the link, <coughs> I can think of uh, the, the graph of that path as uh, being sort of an interval in, uh, in S3 cross I between it and the lead. I see, oh, sorry, I'm saying this wrong. Um, so I just take the link cross I in S3 cross I as a, as a cross I in S3. And you move the, the graph of this path, and now I have some cobordism in a B3 cross path. Okay. And so that gives me some cobordism, so particularly that gives me some particular map between these files. Okay. So I've defined now this vector bundle and the notion of parallel transport, <coughs> and I'm going to define the Kavanaugh homology to be the flat sections under that parallel transport. What do we need to check to make sure that that isn't ridiculous? Well, if we expect to have any flat sections, we better check there's no more. So what, is, what does that mean? You, I, this, well, what does that mean? So imagine you've got some point in the complement of a link, and you move that point around a strand of the link somewhere. Okay? That means you have some particular, that, that when you think in S3 cross I, that gives you some cobordism in B3 cross I, and we have to be sure that that's the identity. So now what have I done? I've defined a vector space. We'll come back to it.
analysis is here today. You now I've defined a vector space, Greek link in a, in a three sphere, and I need now to define maps for cobordism to this thing cos i. And we essentially follow your notes. So given a surface in S3 cos i, choose a path in S3 cos i that connects the inner and outer boundary S3s and that avoids our surface. Okay? When you cut that out, you now have some cobordism in a B3 cross I. And in particular, you can think of it as a map from one of the fibers for the first link to one of the fibers for the final link. Okay? But since the, the, we were talking about flat sections here, you can def defining a map between flat sections, all you need to do is tell, say, how we map a point in one individual fiber. Place. And so we do that by cutting out some path. But even though when you have a surface in S3 cross I, certainly choose a path that goes from the inner to the outer boundary, avoiding the surface, but there are different ways that you can do that aren't isotopic. And this map might depend on the trace. So that's another thing if you're going to postpone a little bit. You're going to have to check that, that this construction didn't depend on the complementary path that we chose in order to do this construction. Okay. So the point is, oh, um, okay. Back on the previous slide, I told you what to do with the cobordism in S2 cross I, which is a very special case of the lasagna diagram with just one ball on each side. I also need to specify what to do when there are multiple walls, but since I'm, I'm just going a little bit slower than I expected at the beginning, let me just jump over how you actually define this. It's no more interesting than what was on the previous slide. The point of this slide is to define the maps in the lasagna diagram. Let me look at this here these slides for Okay. And the definition we gave depended on some choices, and we've got to check that it's in individual choices. Okay. So what's the point? The point is that the flatness of this bundle and the choices we made uh, are all resolved by answering the same, the same question. So here, this, this movie script here is showing you a particular isotopy of some of some node. So inside T, I want you to imagine some tangle with two boundary points, and just close it up on the right. And all that I'm doing in this movie is taking that outside span and sweeping it all the way around. Okay? So when we look like this, it's some long sequence of Radomeister nodes. There's a Radomeister 1 move. And then when I move this span behind the tangle, there's some long sequence of Radomeister 2 and 3 moves as I go. Right? So for modern homology, a priori associates some crazy map to this thing. The claim is we want that to be open. And a good way to think about this is just that in S3, this isotopy, swinging that strand around, is itself isotopic to the identity. You can think about the surface it sweeps out, and you can sort of inflate it out through infinity to move it back to just sort of the constant isotopy. But it's not isotopic to the identity of B. And so this is the, the new thing we need to check to make things work. This composition is one. And uh, something we need to check, and it's a sort of painful thing to check, because depending on how complicated this tangle is, it might be an arbitrarily complicated composition. Which one should I start? I'm, I'm, I'm going slower than I thought, but I don't want to go too much over time. Okay, we'll go for 10 minutes. So, okay. So we need to analyze this map. And um, we can do so. Um, let me go through these maybe a little bit too fast to, to, to really explain what's going on. But the idea is that you want to analyze just one small piece of that that, uh, that composition I was talking about before. And we just do this. We've got some tangle of two boundary points and a screw behind it. And like a screw that's in the the method of proof here is as follows. We actually we define three different maps that get us between the Kibanov invariants in this first one and the Kibanov invariants in the final one. The first map, R, is just the sequence of randomized nodes that Kibanov homology describes that we're meant to use. And S and TU are much simpler, combinatorially defined gadgets that, that don't really depend very much on, or that don't depend on all the randomized nodes. And Essentially, TU is a very, very simple map that we can understand very well. And 
the method of proof is just to say, oh, R is the same as S, and X is the same as TU, and then we can plug that TU back into the previous calculation. <coughs> So, how does the randomized maps? Let me say this, and if you know a lot about Kamala homology, you'll see that you'll understand what it means if you don't. So, Kamala homology associates to this table some big Q where the vertices are all the ways to resolve into crossing the same Okay? And that, well, okay. And then you can see that the two cubes here have an obvious bijection between the vertices. Okay? If I tell you any way to resolve, all the crossings in here, you can resolve the crossings in there the same way, and if I can really resolve that, you can resolve that the same way. The two pictures don't look the same, because it spans out in a couple of ways. It's a very different. But the point is that the map S is... Okay, yeah, um, that vector is actually slightly more wrong. The map S is diagonal in the sense that it maps this cube to that cube, and whatever resolution you took on the inside, it only sends that term to the same resolution over here, but it might change the resolution of the outside. Of the okay? And the point is that those, each of those diagonal entries is given by something very simple. What does a, let, let's think about what a, uh, what a particular vertex of that cube looks like. So what have we done here? We've resolved all of the crossings in the inside tangle, but there's still this strand sitting behind. Okay? And here we're looking at some different resolution of the internal crossings. And over here, I'm looking at the corresponding resolution of the final tangle and the corresponding resolution of the final tangle. Okay. And what I want to do is tell you what S looks like. S is mapping this guy to this guy, and this guy to this guy. And all that it does is move this string down. And notice that as we move this string down, because we've resolved everything inside, we don't need to do right amounts to three moves, we can just do right amounts to two moves. Okay. So the definition of S is just on each resolution of the internal tangle, do the right amounts to two moves that sweep the outside of the, the back string from top of it. And it's easy to check that that really is defining the chain map. And um, then the map T is something <coughs> even simpler that doesn't, that, that intermediate map we had to know about right amounts to two moves to define, but not right amounts to three. In this final map T, you we don't even know anything. And we just very explicitly say if you want to go from this resolution to this resolution, um, what, do, what do they look like? What do resolutions those internal final tangles look like? There's the strand that goes right through the tangle, and there's a bunch of circles on either side. And the circles have an obvious bijection between them, so there's a map that goes from here to here where you just kind of connect up the, the, the circles and bijection by cylinders. Okay. okay. Anyway, you can show all those maps are actually the same. TU is sufficiently easy to analyze, and you can check that that normal is. Oh, there you go. The maps are the same. This was the one new thing in all of this work. Okay. So let's zoom back out for a while and talk in the last few minutes about the prospects for actually doing any calculations of this crazy brain. And the thing to say at the beginning is that it's all bad news. And so far, there are very few calculations. Um, the standard four ball just gives normal components. You can do that. S4 force field, no boundary, gives a one-dimensional vector space, which is the field of B3 cross S1, maybe the next simplest four manifold. We can give answers for a few links at a sort of engineering level of rigor, not even a physical level. As in, we can do calculations where at certain steps we say, gosh, wouldn't it be nice if this algebra of moves were equivalent to that one? And that's the extent of the calculation so far. B4, S4, and a few simple links in B3 process. Let me give you a sense of why calculations are so um, the Let's not read the, the fine details of this slide. Well, let me just say that this recipe tells us how to associate a vector space to any format. But it also tells us, in the manner that's described here, if you read past, how to associate a category to any three manifolds. And the nice thing about this recipe is that it lets us compute the invariant of a large four manifold by slicing it up into pieces along three manifold components. Okay? So 
neural lat of this game appear in the next game, which says this. So here, uh, we've got some four manifold W, which is, uh, which has two boundary components, both from N. So here's a schematic picture of W, and two copies of the Okay? But then I can think about the four manifold I get by gluing together those two copies, and this is what I've written on the slide as W, union along N, and that arrow is meant to be read as with itself. Okay? The, the point is that this cut open manifold gives us some collection of vector spaces. This, uh, this three manifold M, we associate some one category, and it turns out that the vector spaces we associate with this cut open W forms a bimodule over that category that we associate to M. Okay? And this theorem is saying that you can compute the ingredient this glued up guy by taking a tensor product of this bimodule over that category itself. So this is like computing the Going variants of the of a, of a line on the, or like the, the eight fit, the, the zero quadrant. So, so the, the part where you're going is itself must be. Yeah, so in, like in B3 cross S1, so we're thinking that, about cutting that along a three ball. So does that suggest that we could then figure out what happens to the other three ball? So that's that would look more interesting than perhaps an interesting format. Yeah. Um, um, so this formula, in principle, uh, lets you do computations based, I mean, given any handle decomposition, this in principle tells you what the answer is. The problem is... Oh, oh I see. Both pieces have to be the same. And you have M and M up, and it's the same thing? Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the M and M up are the same thing. Oh, but they can be... Oh, the bits of the three okay. So... But, but then, since it's a few manifold, uh, you know, you can, you can, I mean, handle, adding a two handle, Four ball and four ball. Oh, but in that case, we just think of W as being disconnected. We just think right, of W okay. as being So, so in theory, you want to do that. Yeah. So this, in principle, tells you, given a handle decomposition, here's the answer. Yeah. Computed so as some iterated tensor product. Yeah, so what's that? So the, the difficult, well, the, the, the difficulty, the difficulty is right. that after you glued up some pieces, say you glue on the one handle, and it's time to glue on the two handles, the difficulty is explicitly identifying this bimodular action. I just was asking one single piece. On the, you know, on the mod. Yeah, I mean, because in that case, it seems like your one of your modules is the ordinary bonus cohomology of the four ball with that knot. Yeah, and the other one is like the four ball with the one knot. Yeah, but let's think about what M is. M now is some solid torus. Yeah, which and oh, so the, you haven't done the solid torus. And so yeah, the, the, the category associated with solid torus is, could be very complex, and it could be a solid torus with um, a finite subset of points marked in the boundary. Different answers for all different finite subsets, and you need to know you need to know all of those answers at some point. Okay. So this is the yeah, yeah, yeah. we've sort of tried to do one case of this. We think of B three plus X one as a copy of B four. We've taken two B three patches and put them together. Okay. And we have a probably wrong answer, but the, but the, I think. Even though the answer we have written down is probably wrong, uh, I think it, 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 it gives you clues about what you expect from this. In particular, the answer that we get now, that we, that we get, uh, is infinite dimensional, the B3 plus S1, where I'm mean, a few particular small ones here, but it, it has this finite missing gradient detail. So, uh, and it also tells you, uh, well, the computation we did here in B3 plus S1 also tells you. One of the main tools for computing the usual Kavana homology in the, in the free sphere maybe isn't available in this setting. So let's, uh, let's try and understand this a little bit. So we can say something like this. Let's just see what goes on back in the normal Kavana homology. <coughs> the point is that there's a long exact sequence. So what I mean by here is some link in, and I see somewhere inside of the crossing, and what I can do is I can think about that same link of that crossing replaced by one of its two resolutions. Okay. And the point is that if you can have a long exact sequence, so that this guy and this guy and this guy, so if you know well enough these guys, 
In practice, this is extremely effective. So what you might hope is that the same thing happens. Say now that we have a page of some fixed format goals, but let's look at the vector space that we get by varying the movement's boundary. Calculations within V3 plus X1. This is A or <coughs> Oh yeah, this is this is A, the thing that I've been defining is A. Uh, this is some other people. Uh, the calculations we did when, when W is equal to V3 plus X1 uh, seem to suggest that this exact triangle fails. Which is bad news because well, it was a nice tool for the computations. But it's also to be expected. Essentially the idea is that this thing is a you have no right to expect it to be that because it's defined by the people that you see this demonstration. So, something that Kevin and I have been working on for a number of years now is this gadget called the blog complex, which is sort of like a derived version of this whole construction. Um, where, and because it's a derived version, you expect that sort of exactness properties that hold the blog of the lasagna continue to hold up at the level of the virtual network. It turns out that in, in this situation you don't quite get an exact sequence, uh, an exact triangle related to these three guys here, but you get some spectral sequence. These guys sitting in the spectral sequence are not so zero. Maybe in principle you can do a computation of that, but that would be something for the future. So, Certainly should allow for the possibility that this thing over time doesn't actually depend on the, on the interior property. It doesn't depend on the interior Because before you categorified and you were just doing those quantities, but you did see that thing over It's possible that that happens up here. But it's not clear that that happens. So one thing to say on that note, I know we talked about this for a moment, but um, there's this thing closely related to the component of the called the S invariant, which is just a simple image of value. Various reasons is very interesting. And uh, you might imagine that, um, uh, look, okay, so in particular, what the S invariant tells you is it gives you a, a lower bound on the, the genus of a surface in the foreground. It gives you a lower bound for the slice of this curve. So you imagine that you could do all of this, machine you and define the S invariant for the infinite for the boundary without it. You not just this construction, you also follow along the whole lesson uh, score. Then you might imagine that you can find some link in a thin sphere which had um, which had sort of different slice genuses in the standard foreball and some exotic foreball if, if such a thing existed. Okay? And maybe you might expect that the um, but sort of, you might get different S invariants depending on which interior program. Okay. And Kronheimer and Wolfka have some very recent results that basically say you shouldn't expect that sort of thing. That the, that the S invariant sort of detects the worst case. That is, if you put a, 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 a link and you think of it as being the boundary, <laughs> now has it right there. <laughs> if you have a, a link in the boundary of some. Of some when you get a link in a thin sphere, it only gives you a lower bound and sort of the worst case slice of the over all possible things. So maybe that is sort of an indication that these invariants too might, might, might be telling you much about what's on the interior. Uh, 
Where we, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the plan is to all meet again at some point. Yeah, it's still on? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think it's still on. No, 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 it's so, off, it's so off. So are you, are you around for a little while? It, it's just like, it's got to get heat out. No, leaving Saturday morning. Okay. I think it's no, it's too bad. done yet. I have a student tell. thinking about sort of surface maps. Yeah. Maps and boost in. Take off the surface area. Okay. And part of his thesis is, yeah, sure, is connected to...